The World Economic Forum happens every year and they discuss what matters are most urgent, the events that are critical to the present time. They are some of the world's most influential people descending down on Davos in their private jets. Of course, no policy is set here, but it gives the public some level of understanding into what these so-called elite have planned for everyone. You came here for the truth, so let me unveil that for you. Today we're going to talk about the World Economic Forum, also known as Davos. I'm going to show you what they said before, I'm going to talk about what they are saying now, and get into the whole issue and why it's important. So let's begin by taking a look at this. Davos man is richer than ever. A decade after the financial crisis poured flat champagne over the World Economic Forum, gold collar executives set to gather there this week. They've bounced back and then some. We're looking at some of the fortunes here doubling and tripling and multiplying. I'll show you a chart actually in just a moment. But essentially what they're talking about here is the widening gap between the haves and the have nots. And they get into the specific details about that. Global billionaire wealth right here has grown from 3.4 trillion in 2009 to 8.9 trillion in 2017. Central bank actions to fight the financial crisis, record low interest rates, and bond buying programs have underpinned this ballooning wealth by driving up the prices of stocks and other assets. It goes on to talk more in this Bloomberg article, but I really wanted to touch on some other issues today. But first, for those who don't know, we're just going to show briefly what the World Economic Forum is. Directly from their website, what makes our annual meeting unique? The World Economic Forum annual meeting is the only yearly gathering that brings together leaders of global society, the heads and members of more than 100 governments, top executives of the 1,000 foremost global companies, leaders of international organizations and relevant non-governmental organizations, the most prominent culture, societal and thought leaders and the disruptive voices of the forum's young global leaders and so on. It goes on. So basically, it's a whole bunch of influential people coming together there are a bunch of talks there's a bunch of reports and they bring all this news and then we get a little bit of the sound bites out there and some of that information tends to move throughout the year and you see the things that they talk about at this meeting become prominent issues in the countries around the world so as I said in the introduction they're not necessarily creating any policy or rules or laws or anything here but what they talk about tends to be important for the countries of their respective governments. And you tend to see that around. We'll see it this year. I'll show you some examples of that. I think it's important to follow what's happening at Davos because it gives us that little tiny bit of insight into the real deal of what we're going to see. These are some of the richest people at Davos. You're looking at Bill Gates, Zuckerberg, and Jamie Dimon and others. But what we're seeing here, for example, in 2009, Bill Gates net worth $50.8 billion. In 2019, $94.5 billion. You could see the change on the right-hand side here. Looking at this, Zuckerberg, huge increase. In fact, the biggest in this list. He goes from $3 billion to $58.6 billion and you could basically go down the list if you're interested to see that all for yourself i think it's important not to see how much they're worth now that doesn't really matter but what they control the power that they have because of the companies they start to own they start to buy into other corporations they start to buy out new companies and then they have their influence within the governments and you find that they're able to skirt around any sort of rules and regulations that are put in place to protect people oftentimes they are able able to get around it in every single possible way. So I just think it's important to see that and how it plays out over the years. Doesn't necessarily happen at any moment, it might unfold years from now. So we keep an eye on it, we document it, we database it, and then we are able to pinpoint it as time goes on. This is a report directly out of the World Economic Forum, the Global Risks Report 2019. When you look through this report, you see the same thing over and over and over again. Climate change, climate risk. 
weather events. All of this is repeated constantly throughout this report. And you can see that the global economy gets mentioned here or there. But one of the most prominent things in here is all about climate change, all about this weather events and other things. And they made that such an important topic that I've seen already in the introduction of the World Economic Forum becoming a very, very prominent issue. We can definitely go into the report, but I don't want anyone to fall asleep. So I'm gonna just let you have this report. It's linked in the description if you're interested, but understand that that's the most prominent factor for this year, it seems. A new billionaire was created every two days last year, just as the poorest half of the world's population saw their wealth decline by 11%. This tells us how severe the wealth gap is. This is an extreme example because you're looking at the billionaires of the world, the most elite in terms of their wealth, and then the bottom everybody else, all right? The poorest half of the world. I just saw a statistic that said something like 26 of the richest people in the world hold more wealth than the bottom half. The bottom half. Imagine that. We're getting close to 4 billion people people in that statistic. So that is extremely, extremely wide. And unfortunately, it's only getting worse. They talk about the issues here that government needs to do more for people. I don't really think that's the issue personally. I think it goes a lot deeper than that. It's the central banking system itself that has enriched the richest of the rich people. And the super, super wealthy aren't even part of this list, of course, but that's a whole different topic. Davos no-shows reflect the world in a state of crisis. Many of the leaders of the world are actually not attending this year. It's not just one individual. And of course, this is a problem today because the world is in a state of crisis. That is completely a fact today. When you can see that many people have claimed everything is just fine. Well, some things are great. There's no doubt about that. Some things are definitely doing well. However, we could see the state of the global economy not so well and that is unfortunate and it's being shown right here in Davos, Switzerland. Back in 2011, this was actually said. World needs $100 trillion more credit, says the World Economic Forum. The world's expected economic growth will have to be supported by an extra $100 trillion in credit over the next decade. Think about what that means. They have to pump up $100 trillion out of their fake printing presses, fiat money, pump it into the system to try and keep it alive. That's what they're talking about here. $100 trillion would create mass levels of inflation like the world has never seen before on a global scale. And so they want to embark on that. We have seen unprecedented levels of quantitative easing and they want to take it even further. Obviously, I think this is a huge mistake, but this is what they said back in 2011. They're working towards that goal, I assure you. However, we'll see what happens. They haven't gone to that level of $100 trillion yet but they have certainly been printing a lot of money. Now, what would the cause of this be? Why would they do this when everything is fine? You know, that's the problem that we've seen today. We have a few people making the rules for a lot of individuals, and that never works out historically. And that's the way it goes, and we'll see what happens over the next few months as time goes on here. The World Economic Forum produced this chart and you can see whether we're looking at the United States, maybe you wanna look at the Euro area and so on, but this is the world output. You'll see how it breaks down over here. United States for 2018's estimate at 2.9% and that was definitely lower than where they were expecting it to be. They wanted it above 4%, didn't happen that way. 4% is difficult to get in an economy like this today where you don't have have that manufacturing base that you once had. It's all a temporary work. It's all retail jobs. It's going to take many, many decades to get back to those growth levels that were excessively high before. We'll see if that's even possible, but many of the more so-called advanced economies don't achieve that ever anymore, at least for the last few decades. 
The Guardian is doing a live update on what's happening at the World Economic Forum. I'll have the link in the description for you here. But they had this one. I thought it was interesting. IMF Chief Lagarde. Risk of sharper decline in global growth has increased. IMF head Christine Lagarde just spoke at the WEF. She said while a global recession was not yet around the corner, the risk of a sharper decline in global economic growth had certainly increased. She added that policymakers must prepare for a serious slowdown and called on them to reduce high levels of government debt to boost economic resilience. She concluded by saying, the international community must come together to build a brighter future for all. And of course, that's always the case. They want them to come together, right? Not necessarily to shake hands and be friendly. Of course, they want more global governance. They want the supranational entities to control everything. But it is important to note what they point out. I really do like the IMF's reports. Every single one, for the most part, seems to point to the right issues and it tells the right story. I don't like the solutions, but I like what they point to. And right here, she makes a good point. When you have high levels of government debt, all because they bailed out the private sector, mind you, this is obviously going to have an impact on the future of all of these countries. And it's never going to end up well. If you look at historically, any country that has printed their way out of a problem ends up in a deeper one soon enough. Sometimes it takes one year, sometimes Sometimes it takes 10 years, sometimes it takes 100 years, but eventually it catches up to them. Look at the historical examples and you will see the failure, the constant, constant failure of governments who try to print their way out of the mess that they're in. They devalue the currency, they debase their coinage, and they always, always spread their empire too thin and they fall. Big mistake. There's no reason for this. You can do your best to slow things down, contract where you see the excesses and not have to blow up all these bubbles, but you do over and over and over again. That's just the way it is. Okay, so this is the link that will be in the description. You could see right here, it's showing you live, constantly being updated. So check that out for yourself. I'll have the link down below. That's all for this video. If you found it informative, please give me a thumbs up and give me a thumbs up. You're supporting this channel. So I do appreciate that very much. And last but not least, if you want the financial education that was not taught to you in school, these two books have everything that you need. I cover the asset classes, how to profit, reducing your debt, making money a lot in here. Check them out the link in the description. If you want the audiobook version, you can get that at themoneygps.com.